Hi, this is Pastor Steve Feinstein, and I'm here to conclude my uh, series where I'm going through this book, this Nine Marks book written by Michael Lawrence called Biblical Theology in the Life of the Church. As I've been saying, this is a fantastic book. Um, Biblical theology is something that should be in the life of the church. I mean, it should be in every single sermon, and it should also lead to a systematic theology in which the the doctrines of the Bible are applied and codified and, and again, applied to our lives. And so um, this is my fourth uh, video about this book. If you're just watching this one first, you're probably going to feel lost. I strongly recommend you go back and watch the first, second, and third video before this one, uh, especially the second video. But my goal is just to go through this and finish quickly. Um, and, and then afterwards, I'll tell you what will be the, the next book that, that I plan on going through. So that all being said, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, I defined biblical theology um, a few videos ago, and biblical theology is, is where we look at the meta narrative, the story that unites all 66 books of the Bible. They're, they're not meant to be seen as individual disjointed books that have nothing to do with each other. God inspired the scripture, and they're all telling one story a story of, of a creation and the fall and redemption, and then the consummation when God recreates everything, right? When he makes everything new, the new heavens, new earth, and we'll, we will live forever in it, right? And so we fit into this story. And, and every biblical text you read has to be studied at the textual level where you're looking like, what does the text say? You use the historical grammatical method to do that. I already talked about that in depth. And then after that, you look at the epical level, what epic within the scripture, what covenant is operative for that particular text. And then you look at it canonically, like it, it, in this particular epic where this text is found, is there a promise that's being made that then gets fulfilled later? And how does it get fulfilled later? Is it through type? Is it through prophecy? Is it promise fulfillment? So again, I explained all those things. I don't have time to explain them again. So please go back and listen to the, the previous video if you uh, have not heard these yet. Um, but what I'm going to do is just finish this off. So after we went over what biblical theology is and how biblical theology is done, <clears throat> in the last video, uh, I then talked about how Michael Lawrence then more or less uh, tells you five stories or five themes that uh, go from Genesis to Revelation. The first was the story of creation. Uh, you see the story of creation all throughout the pages of Scripture. Creation, fall, recreation. And then it escalates. Creation, fall, recreation, until eventually we get to the new creation and the cycle's over. And then the second theme was the fall itself. You, you have the fall, and then you have a redemption, and then you have the fall, and then redemption, and so forth. And the cycle repeats until, again, we end up at the new creation, right? So there's three more themes or stories that Michael Lawrence hits in this book that he says a biblical theology will reveal these three stories. The first one is that the Bible ultimately is a story of love. It's a story of creation. It's a story of the fall. It's also a story of love. And then it's a story of sacrifice, which is definitely related to the love. It's a story of uh, sacrifice. And then it's a story of um, promise, okay, promise and fulfillment. So again, my plan is to go through these pretty quickly. So how is the Bible a story of love, a biblical theology of love? Well, first, what we understand is that is that, look, what does it mean to love? I mean, we know that in 1 John 4, 16, it says God is love. And what happens is in our culture, we tend to supply what that means. And we try to say, well, love means this or love means that. But if you want to know what it means for God to be love, then you want to look at how God loves throughout the entire story of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. And then that makes it to where you won't misunderstand or misdefine what it means for God to be love, right? And so the way that the Bible presents God as love is the Bible presents God's relationship to his people as a marriage. And it's a marriage that's based on the fact that God for all eternity loved God. That the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had a perfect love for each other. And, uh, and then, of course, when God creates a people, when he creates the world and then he creates man, um, you know, there, there's the love of his creation. And then, of course, after the fall, there's you'll just see how it all plays out as I go forward. And so 
it begins with Adam and Eve. The Bible actually starts with the marriage after everything is, is created. And, and if you think about marriage, just think about it for a second. Love is to be chosen. Okay, when you got married, you chose your spouse. You could have said no. Okay, so so love, if it's being presented biblically, always through the lens of, of a marriage, metaphorically speaking, then that lets you know love is always to choose somebody to the exclusion of others. So Adam was married to Eve to the exclusion of anybody else, right? Now, of course, Adam and Eve fall, and, 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 and so what happens is God banishes them, as I've already mentioned, but then what does God do? God loves Noah right? He loves Noah and, and makes a covenant with Noah. And then, of course, we see Noah's descendants completely mess up. You have the Tower of Babel is, is the story of, of love and, and God uh, fixing himself to a people. Is that over? No, because then you have Genesis chapter 12 where God chooses Abraham, right? Love is always choosing. Okay, so God is going to have a unique relationship with Abraham that he doesn't have with anybody else. And he says, I'm going to build a nation out of you and out of all the nations of the earth. This one nation is going to be God's nation, right? And God's going to have a unique relationship with them. So if you notice, God had a covenant with Adam and Eve that fell apart because of Adam and Eve's disloyalty to the love of God. Then God makes a covenant with Noah, but humanity rebels and so now God uh, has a covenant with Abraham where he's going to then make a nation. He's going to have this exclusive relationship with Israel. And then that gets ratified with the Mosaic covenant when God brings Israel out of Egypt and you have the law of Moses. And God even describes Israel as his bride. He even says that, that uh, I didn't choose you because you're greater than any nation. I didn't choose you because you have any greatness to you. I chose you because I love you. Okay, that's what God says to Israel. And then again, when we get to the prophets, they're described, uh, Israel's described as God's wife. It's a marriage. But then Israel's unfaithful. So then God banishes Israel. We talked about banishment in the last video. And then God returns Israel to the land. And then the ultimate expression of God's love is through the next covenant, isn't it? Well, I, I left out the Davidic covenant. God loves Israel by giving them King David, right? And, and promising through King David is going to be uh, the Messiah, the, the Savior. And then eventually, after Israel comes back to the land, the Messiah is born. Jesus is born. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? His son who he loved for all eternity past, right? Father and son loved each other perfectly. And yet God gave that one, the father gave the one whom he loved up for us so that people of every nation would believe on Jesus and be saved and become the people of God, right? And so that's the, the, the love, the story of love um, permeating throughout the whole Bible. And how does the scripture then describe we who are saved by Jesus? Not only are we a new creation, which brings us back into that, that story of creation that permeates the Bible, but we're called the bride of Christ. And the story ends with the wedding. It began with the wedding. It ends with the wedding with Christ and his bride. And see, with, with Adam and Eve, that marriage was arranged, right? They didn't have a choice. That marriage was arranged. But God had a choice. Jesus had a choice. And he chose us, right? So the love of God is God entering into a covenant with people where he has a distinct love for them, a love to the exclusion of other people. Like I don't love, uh, although I'm supposed to love my neighbor as I love myself, which means I'm loving women neighbors, I don't love them the way I love my wife. The love I have for my wife is distinct, it's covenantal, and that's the same love that God has for his people. He has a general love for everybody, the Bible makes that clear, but he has a special love for his bride. And this relates to the doctrine of election, where God chooses his bride before the foundation of the world, writes our names in his book before the foundation of the world, and then he provides for our salvation. Why? Because God is is love. So when we look at the verse in 1 John 4:16, God is love. What does it mean? 
Just think of what we learn about God's marriage relationship with his people throughout all of scripture. It, the Bible begins this way, it ends this way, and it teaches us a lot of truths about God. First, it teaches us that marriage is important and marriage matters. It teaches us that, that love is always expressed through a covenant. And so if you're not part of the new covenant where you are Christ's bride, then God doesn't love you like he loves those who are part of his new covenant. See, people try to say, well, if God's going to be fair, he has to love everybody the same. That's not what God says. That's not what his word says. That's not, you're giving yourself more freedom than God. You could love your wife and your kids in a special way that you don't love everybody with, okay? But God has to love everybody equally? That doesn't make any sense. No, God has specialized, distinct love in the form of covenants to people who are the recipients of that love and covenants that he doesn't have towards those who are outside of the covenant. So when the Bible says God is love, that's what it means. People try to use that verse to say God has to save everybody. No. what the, the, the story of the Bible defines this love as a love where God chooses even though he didn't have to choose us. That God then saves us even though he didn't have to save us. That, that, that God uh, is devoted to us because he's devoted to Christ and we're united to Christ. So the love of God is an amazing doctrine. It's an amazing story that permeates the, the entire scripture. Okay, so then the second, or the, well, actually this is the fourth, but the second for this video. The next theme or story is the Bible's also from Genesis to Revelation, a story of sacrifice, right? After the fall, the first formal sacrifice we see is Cain and Abel's sacrifice, right? And of course, he accepted Abel's, he rejected Cain's, but this was a sacrifice of tribute. There's nothing about sin or, or blood or anything like that specifically mentioned. They're just making an offering to God as tribute because God is, is, is king. So that lets you know right away that sacrifice is tribute to God. Well, then the next sacrifice mentioned is Noah's sacrifice in Genesis chapter 8. And that's a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Noah's thanking God for sparing him and remaking the creation. So sacrifice is tribute to a king. Sacrifice is thanksgiving. And God listened to Noah's sacrifice. He smelt the aroma and it pleased him. And then he blessed Noah. So God responds to sacrifice, right? The next sacrifice was Genesis 22, where God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Now, of course, he wasn't really going to do it. This was a test. But again, this is a sacrifice that's a substitute, okay? Because God has a substitute stand in the place of Isaac when there's a ram that's given. So sacrifice is going to be a tribute to God. It's going to be thanksgiving to God. It's going to be substitutionary. We see that. The next sacrifice is in Exodus 12 with the Passover, which is also substitutionary. The lamb substitutes the firstborn of Israel, and the firstborn of Israel stands as representative of all of Israel. So now sacrifice is substitutionary, and it's representative, okay? So all these sacrifices are painting a picture of what the ultimate sacrifice is going to be. What came next was Leviticus, and all the sacrifices of Leviticus, their thanksgiving, their peace, offerings, they're all these things, but ultimately, especially with the greatest sacrifice in Leviticus, it's atonement. It's the removal of sin. It's propitiation, where our sin, our guilt is transferred to an innocent victim, and that innocent victim then takes our penalty for us. That's what Leviticus shows. And so this is the, the animal sacrifice system. And so each sacrifice points to the next sacrifice in a, a typological way, right? The first one is a type of the next one, of the next one, of the next one. Each one re uh, reveals more and more of what the ultimate sacrifice that's going to save us must be. This relates to God's love. If he's going to love us, um, he has to take care of our biggest problem, which is sin. And so all of that then points to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus, who was a sacrifice of all these things. Okay, he is our substitute, right? He's the one who removes our sin. He's our representative. Um, he, he's all these things, a substitute, substitute representative, um, you know, and, and so when we take everything the Bible shows about sacrifice, Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice, and that's why there's not sacrifices any anymore. So we see that, that this is a, a typology, 
one sacrifice to the next. We see this as promise and fulfillment. Abraham knew that, you know, based on what God said, that God would provide the lamb, and he did. And Jesus is the lamb of God who removes the sins of the world, which means people of, of every nation. Now, how this informs our systematic theology is that sin is our biggest problem. And so the wages of sin is death. How does God solve that? Through a, a, a penal substitutionary atonement. Somebody who is innocent, perfectly innocent, which is Jesus Christ, had to die in our place, taking our punishment. That's what penal means. And since he's in our place, that's substitutionary. It's vicarious. He's doing it for us, right? And by him dying for us that way, he removes our penalty, and then we receive his reward since he was perfectly righteous. The other thing we know is the sacrifices were efficacious, Okay, when, when a sacrifice, a Passover sacrifice happened, guess what? The firstborn of Israel didn't die. And when the, the sacrifices in the Levitical system happened, God counted these people as forgiven. So Jesus' sacrifice then isn't a sacrifice that makes forgiveness possible. It has to be a sacrifice that makes forgiveness actual because that's what happened with the previous sacrifices. Furthermore, the Old, the, the Old Testament sacrifices were for a specific people, not everybody, right? And it was efficacious for those people. That lets us know that the ultimate sacrifice likewise is for a specific people and it actually purchases the redemption for them. So it's a limited atonement, right? When you look at how the whole story of the Bible presents the theme of sacrifice, presents it as exactly what I'm saying, a limited atonement or a particular redemption that solves our biggest problem, which is sin. And because this is what solves our problem, it makes it clear we can't save ourselves, and therefore salvation is by faith, right? It, it, it's a gift of grace. And then the final thing to say about sacrifice is we're saved by Jesus' sacrifice, and then this makes us ourselves living sacrifices unto God, meaning his sacrifice cleanses us and then sanctifies us to where we ourselves now live as those who are set apart towards God. So you see this unfold from Genesis to Revelation, how the doctrine or the theme of sacrifice grows, grows, and expands until it culminates on Christ. Now, have you noticed in everything, Christ is the ultimate fulfillment, right? All the, 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 the theme of creation led us to Christ who brings the new creation, right? The theme of the fall led us to Christ when the ultimate, most egregious sin of mankind was crucifying Christ, but through that, he defeated our enemies' sin and death. And then love, okay, the story of love throughout the Bible, again, brings us to Christ, which is God's ultimate love. And now the story of sacrifice that permeates the scriptures brings us to the ultimate sacrifice, which is Christ. Now the fifth and, and final I guess you could say theme that, that Michael Lawrence says runs from Genesis to Revelation is the theme of promise, you know, and, and you could say that promise and God keeping his promise is the main plot that moves the whole story of scripture. So the fall happens, right? Genesis 3.15, God makes a promise that there will be redemption through the seed of the woman and a spiritual war between the people that God is going to make called the seed of the woman and the people that God obviously they're, he's, he's not their God, right? Uh, the seed of the serpent. They follow Satan, whether they realize it or not. So God makes the promise that there's going to come a deliverer who's going to crush Satan and his followers once and for all, and then deliver God's people. Okay. And so that's the promise. Well, Satan's always trying to stop that promise. So Cain kills Abel. Oh, is that the end? Nope. God follows through. And so then Seth is born. And then you have a godly line from Seth. Well, then because of sin, God is going to judge the world. Is, is the promise broken? Nope. God spares Noah. And then through Noah, the world gets repopulated. Well, then you have the Tower of Babel. Okay. Is the promise now broken? Because because God now has to judge the world. Well, yes, he judges the world, but then guess what comes? Abraham. So the promise continues. And then Abraham, you know, becomes a nation, Israel. Well, then the world rises up and enslaves Israel. Is the promise broken? Nope. God destroys Egypt and brings Israel out gives them the Mosaic Covenant. They become his people. He puts them in the promised land. Okay, so the promise is, is fulfilled, everything he told to Abraham there. But, but there's more to come, right? Israel uh, sins by saying, we want a king to be like the nations. So they get a king that's wicked and is leading them in the wrong way. And then God 
to fulfill his promise, provides them a king after his own heart, David. And then obviously David's sons and, you know, sin to the point where the kingdom splits, it gets divided. Eventually they end up in exile. Is the promise over? Nope. God then brings them back from exile. And even though David's sons weren't sitting on a throne, God kept their lineage alive. And then ultimately, the ultimate promise is when Jesus Christ himself, the God-man, the, the King of Kings, the son of David is born in Bethlehem. And he comes, you know, to ultimately crush the head of the serpent. The serpent does strike his heel through the crucifixion. But then Jesus conquers sin and death through his death, burial, and resurrection, thus crushing the head of the serpent. And so Satan's a defeated foe. His days are numbered. And uh, we just wait for Christ to return. That's the last promise that we wait for, for him to return. And then Satan is, is, is forever judged and destroyed. And, and we inherit, again, the new creation. Right, So uh, the, the new creation itself is a promise and it will be fulfilled. So when we look at all the promises God has made and we see how he always fulfills, always fulfills, we can trust that the only promise left to be fulfilled is going to be fulfilled. And that teaches you a lot systematic in terms of systematic theology. One, it teaches you that God is faithful um, and that God is patient. And so that teaches us that we have to be patient, right? Because if you think about how long it took between each iteration of promise and fulfillment, like a promise is given and then the next level gets fulfilled. Sometimes we're talking centuries, okay? God's timing's not our timing. But we know when we look back through salvation history, he keeps his promises. And so we could trust that he, he's not slow at keeping his promises. He's long-suffering. There are more people who are still the recipients of his promises who are supposed to come to faith. And it is on us to call them into faith, right? And so you could trust God. Uh, he will cause those who belong to him to persevere. So you see the, the perseverance of the saints in, in all of that. And so um, it's just amazing. Like, And so I hope like when you see all this, in all five of these themes, creation, fall, love, sacrifice, and promise, that what you see is from Genesis to Revelation, you see promise and fulfillment escalating, right? You keep having multiple fulfillments escalating. You see types, and each type keeps escalating till you get to the anti-type, the final one to whom they all point. And, and that in all of this that you see, it always culminates in Christ. That is why he says the volume of scripture is about me. Now, when it comes to this book, um, the rest of the book that I'm not covering is specifically geared towards pastors and how all of this helps us with our preaching and our counseling and all of that. I'm going to spare you guys that because that's more for people that do what I do. But my whole goal with these four videos was just to teach you how to read the Bible. And so I'm praying that you learned that, that you will forever look at the Bible from the textual, epical, and canonical horizon. And I also pray that uh, that you will see these five themes that Michael Lawrence um, you know, pointed out to us when you're reading the scripture, that you'll see how all oh, this is there and this does work throughout the pages of scripture. With that, I'm done with this book. What I could tell you is I know this was a heavy concept, right? This was a, a heavy book. So I'm going to do a couple lightweight books. If you look at this one, it's another Nine Marks one called What is the Church? So the next few are going to be a lot easier to grasp and a lot quicker to go through. So I look forward to uh, our next video and thank you very much.